Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back for the second half. <laughs> That's great. We're, we're, already, we're, we're already getting into the real FC Barcelona <laughs> atmosphere. Uh, Matt, you know, unfortunately, Matt, you know, they closed uh, the stadium. This, this vodka. <laughs> so we couldn't, uh, we couldn't welcome you there. Because everybody's rowdy before we even spoke. That's right. That's right. And, and even there's no alcohol. So, you know, uh, they can do that all on their own. Um, so welcome to you, uh, Matt Murray. Thanks, Thanks for, for, for making the trip over. Matt, as you uh, know, as you've heard from Carl, made the trip all the way from New York. Um, how was the trip? Uh, you landed quite all right. It was great. It's been, it was fine. It was good. Uh, I probably wouldn't have done it if you were in Frankfurt, to be honest. So it's good to be here. <laughs> well, we're glad you made it uh, and that you're here with us uh, today. Matt Murray is the uh, editor-in-chief of the you Wall know, Street former, Journal. Former, former. Uh, until, I suppose, March of 2023 was uh, the editor-in-chief. Yeah, it was February. February. Um, uh, and uh, you've been at the newsroom for several decades, is that right? I was there for almost 29 years. Wow, that's uh, longer than most of us have lived. So uh, that's... <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, that's exactly what I needed to hear. Uh, so that's a really long, uh, long career. What do, you, wait, what do you mean most of us? <laughs> right. Uh, you know, I'm actually not that much uh, uh, older okay. uh, than most of the people here. I would have been eight. Uh, I would have <laughs> maybe been able to read, but maybe not in English uh, when you started. The yeah, journal. probably not something as boring as the Wall Street Journal. Though. Right. You know, I actually did read some uh, some journal articles uh, in college. You know, can you believe it? I am that old, though, that when I started reading the Wall Street Journal, there were no pictures. Yeah, that's true. Uh, do you remember? Well, you, of course, remember that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Matt, you know. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you, I don't want to cut, but I will tell you that when I got out of college, uh, the, the best student in our class was hired right away at the Wall Street Journal. And, and, and are you talking yourself in the third person now? Or? Uh, no, 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 no. I, <laughs> no, I thought, and I thought at that time, I was a, just graduating, I thought, God, that's so boring. That sounds like such a boring oh, wow. work. In business, how boring. That's what I thought. So you spent a few years uh, in local journalism? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I want to start today, though, uh, in a world that we all know, which is, you know, the news environment uh, of right now. If you were leading the Wall Street Journal newsroom today, um, what would you consider to be the most important story and how would you go about covering it? I mean, obviously, the most important story is the war right now in the Middle East. Uh, I think, I think I've been reading coverage uh, across the board and it's a... Obviously, something we're all following, something that's important, something that's really got a lot of challenges in it, both because of the strong uh, emotions it, it brings about on all sides, because of the challenge of getting accurate information from all sides, because of the propaganda challenges, and frankly, uh, because of the real world uh, social media challenges. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a story where, I mean, honestly, I'm sure everybody in this room, all the students are, are, if you're following it, you're following it on social media and following it up close. And so for, for traditional journalism like I did, it's a story where events are frank and, and what people are learning or think that they're learning or think they're seeing is, is frequently well ahead of what you're doing journalistically. Mm. So you have to think hard, what is the role, what's the value that we bring here? Uh, propaganda, social media. I mean, I mean, we know that uh, on the October seventh attack, uh, the, the attackers in that case were uploading on social media before people were necessarily even aware of the story or the scope of what was happening. So, you're behind events if you're a, a news organization. So, so the, the you're, you're really challenged in all the circumstances of what are we bringing? What's special? So you, you'd have to think. If I was in the newsroom. By the way, uh, also, of course, if you're in the newsroom, safety is a gigantic priority in a situation like this as well for the journalists. So I think that what, I, what you can bring, hopefully, is a couple things. One, in, a, in that sea of claims and verifications and postings, try to help figure out what's real and what's not real and bring some factual clarity and context to it. Uh, frankly, I think there's a lot of room for analysis and mm. reported analysis is something I'm a big fan of. And, and honestly, I'm not sure I think, I, I'm not reading methodically and I'm not talking about the Wall Street Journal, but in general, I'd like to read a lot more uh, analysis about, for instance, where the European governments uh, stand and, and, and European populations stand and the challenges of balancing 
uh, the two sides, as well as the role of the Iranians. I'd like to read more about the Saudis' position. There's a lot of things right. you can you can report on because it's a very complex and complicated. So things that you can report on that perhaps on the one hand, sort of zooming in, looking what's real and what's not, and yeah. on the other hand, zooming out and looking at the bigger picture. Yeah, I think I think it's, it's helping helping people understand. I mean, we all have a challenge. We're all wrestling with being flooded with so much information coming our way every second of the day and filling our phones and filling our heads. Um, if you're doing it well, and of course a lot of people don't trust the mainstream media to do this well, but if you're doing it well, helping bring context and ways to think and process that is a really mm. valuable function that we all need right now. Is that also what you would describe as the mission overall of the Wall Street Journal? For those of us who have perhaps not uh, read the Wall Street Journal or at least don't do so on a daily basis, if you had to explain to an international audience of young people, which this audience is, what is really the Wall Street Journal? Yeah, I would describe that as a mission, but not the mission. I, I think of, I thought of the journal as essentially covering the world through the lens of money and business mm. and thinking about, and, and economics, I should say. Um, I mean, you're all business students. Economics, for, so economic systems, frankly, drive a lot of events in the world and help you understand the world. Everybody's interested in money, including philanthropists and people who renounce money. They're interested in the role money plays and the role it can do, whether they want it to enrich themselves or to do good in the world. Um, and business is a gigantic force that moves lots of things in our society for good and ill. So the journal's unique role is to try to focus through those topics and, and using them to help understand the world. You literally follow the money is uh, perhaps one way of putting it. Yeah, and you know, if you think about economics, if you think about uh, so much of our journalism is focused on politics, and I like politics like a lot of people. I'm a, particularly in the States, politics is often like a, a blood sport. It's a, it's a spectator event. And so politics is important in no way, uh, obviously, am I going to diminish the importance of politics in our lives, but politics is often uh, the, the outcome of economics or mm. big things that happen. If you understand economics, if you understand business, if you, you know, if, if you could go back in time and think uh, what's happening uh, in 2007 and 2008 when the, we had the crash through the lens of the next 15 or 20 years of politics, obviously what happened then helped set the stage for a lot of what came in our politics after. So if the Wall Street Journal is doing its job well, it's helping you see those forces, understand those forces, and get ahead of those yeah. forces. And you've worked on, on several important stories, of course, when you were the editor-in-chief and before that uh, in different roles. I want to ask you about that, but perhaps for our audience, it's also helpful to perhaps just talk about how at an organization, an American news organization like the Wall Street Journal, there is actually a very big difference between the newsroom and uh, the editorial board. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, it's much more the tradition uh, in American newspapers for uh, total separation operationally, and in some cases almost philosophically between the, the, the newsroom and the opinion page. So uh, that's not the common model I know in much of the world and, and in Europe. So, um, so in, in Europe you would have perhaps the editor-in-chief sometimes writing an op-ed on the editorial right. pages we would not expect to see that very often in the Wall Street Journal. No, so at the, never, never. So, I mean, at the journal, at the, so at the journal, I was the editor in chief. Uh, my successor is the editor in chief. That means we run the news department. Now, that's probably 90 to 95 percent of the output of the journal, given how big the newsroom is. But separately, the opinion department is run separately, and the editor of the opinion section there was a guy named Paul Jago. And we both reported to the publisher separately. And uh, we, we, I mean, we got on, but we didn't have, uh, we have no operational uh, uh, or editorial uh, overlap. Right. Relationship. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about some of the stories that you have, that your newsroom, let's say, has pursued in your time as editor-in-chief <laughs> and deputy editor-in-chief that you really feel like sort of show uh, what the role of the Wall Street Journal is in the economy and society, the news stories that really sort of moved the needle uh, while you were there? Well, I, I think we had a pretty good run on a few fronts. Probably the best known one that some of you will probably know is the Facebook Files project, which came about 
through our Facebook reporter who, who thanks to a source, now we know the source was Frances Haugen. She's, uh, mm. she's uh, come out and talked about that and written a book, but showed, uh, it was really a sort of a deep dive into Facebook's own research showing many of the- Then still effects. Facebook, but now the company that's known oh, as sorry, Meta. Meta, Meta. Yeah, well, I think our series was probably <laughs> one of the things that caused them to change their name. But uh, the pernicious effects of the product which, through their own data and their own research. So we did a series of stories that uh, revealing that research and showing that they knew, for instance, uh, that, that uh, Facebook was a big, uh, a lot of girls would have anxiety by Facebook and it, their own research showed it was a, dry, a factor for They knew that yeah. and nevertheless kept making money on the back of that was one of the findings. Correct. So I think that was one of the biggest projects we had. We did a lot of work on China and the Chinese economy. We did... Um, uh, a lot of work on uh, uh, General Electric. We did a lot of work on uh, 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 PG&E, which is uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, which is a big electric utility in California with the wildfires showing the problems that they were having um, uh, with old equipment causing fires and looking at their liability and the challenges that they had there and the challenges that caused for the company. We also did, it's interesting, uh, I'm sure everybody here is following every detail of news in America closely. The Supreme Court <laughs> yesterday in the United States put out a new ethics code um, uh, signed by all nine justices. A lot of that is a response to different journalism right. uh, done by a lot of organizations, but we did a series on uh, conflicts of interest for judges uh, uh, th and that that was followed by a series that won the Pulitzer Prize this last year on conflicts of interest for government workers in the federal bureaucracy who are making regulatory decisions and right. making rulings in the case of the judges while often owning and, stocks or companies that, that are affected by those decisions. And it shows a little bit how you know the role of the Wall Street Journal and of media like the Wall Street Journal in uh, democracy, in the US democracy and around the world perhaps, is also that sort of that fourth uh, power, that sort of a check on uh, powerful uh, um, uh, government and business as well. I mean, like I think there's there's other stories from your under your predecessors. I think yeah. the, the Theranos case. Theranos started under my uh, predecessor and then finished uh, under me. The other one that started that we sort of did a handoff on was uh, Wall Street Journal. There was uh, I mean there was a lot of reporting on Donald Trump and Donald Trump's associates, of course, and the media kind of went pretty hog wild for about four years on it. The Wall Street Journal is the only news organization whose reporting resulted in the actual conviction of a, a Trump associate in court. That was being his lawyer, Michael Cohen, uh, because of work we did on on um, uh, how on the on the payments they were making for the women he was involved with. This right. Involved. You you met Donald Trump obviously at several occasions. What do you? Uh, I only met him once. Oh, only met him once. Yeah. So he uh, is not that big of a friend of traditional media. I take it. Uh, oh, I think he's actually quite smart at uh, dealing with reporters, and I think little known, but I think the journalists would tell you this. Probably was better at chatting with reporters and exchanging tips with them and gossiping and other stuff and probably more focused on reporters than any other president in recent memory. Yeah. And then many would like to admit thing. perhaps also. Um, um, but I, you know, I was the editor in chief. He didn't need to deal right. with me he directly. spoke to your reporters. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, one forward looking uh, aspect that I want to talk to you about is the role of AI. We already talked about it uh, briefly with Erdem. This is of course the next big thing in any industry. Um, what is the role of AI going to be in industries like the news industry? Are we now going to read stories by Matt Murray's AI bot, or are you uh, going to keep on having human journalism, so to speak? Well, hopefully we will have human journalism. I think we need to have human journalism. I think that's pretty important, but I think it's going to be profound. I've spent, since I stepped down in February, besides taking vacations, and as you can see, I've gone to seed a little bit from the photo I had of <laughs> Uh, I've spent some time thinking about AI uh, uh, for journalism and working with uh, my parent company, which is News Corp. Uh, it's going to be profound and, and uh, challenging, I think, for the industry. I think on a, on a couple fronts. One, um, we, we have to realize that the, the, the companies that are writing the, the LLMs, the large language models and developing the AI systems, already have been scraping journalism for a long time and using our data and information to help create and shape those systems. Our view in the industry is that they owe us some compensation and, and money for that. 
they are creating essentially um, uh, information sources, partly off that information, that are going to compete with us. By the way, we're going to like them. Right. We're going to like it's, them. It's already happening, for example, in sports journalism, yeah. where oh, 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 oh. you know you get quicker data insights from a robot than from a human. Right. Plenty of people don't like the news, the news media, and don't read it, but you'll you'll get Bing and Bard and. The others giving you pretty, pretty good, good enough, straightforward data and information. So for one thing, they're going to be competition for us, um, uh, which is going to be a challenge. Uh, the, the ecosystem is going to change dramatically with AI because the ability to start a publication or to make a copycat publication is going to be much, much greater. Um, there are going to be, as in every industry, there are going to be likely uh, operational efficiencies which will lead to job displacement. I think so basically there will be less jobs in journalism, would you say? Uh, uh, everything else equal? I don't know if I could predict less jobs in journalism. I mean, we've lost over half the jobs in the industry in the United right. States it since, seems since the year 2000. Uh, so I, I'd like to think that AI will also create new opportunities and new kinds of things we can't envision, but I hope that'll be the case. Um, but, you know, the industry's stressed. And then I think last thing, the hardest thing to think about with AI, it'll, it'll be everybody's job here to be thinking about it more than me, but it will re, what will be the new experiences AI will invent or create that will affect our expectations of how we consume content and news? You know, mm -hmm. if you went back, you were joking about the Wall Street Journal reading it when you were a kid and not having photos. What about video? I mean, if you went back to 1994, and you went to every legacy newsroom and you said, you're all going to have to be making videos and have a vast video capacity, everybody would have said, huh? Right. Um, and today, the journal has a big one, over 100 people in video, they all do. Uh, and all, you guys and people coming up who've grown up in the age of the internet, two thirds of the traffic and content on the internet is video. Is the Wall Street so, Journal on TikTok? Yes, yeah. So I think uh, I like. We could have seen you dancing. Uh, you wouldn't. Have, you wouldn't have seen me, boy. If, if you put me on TikTok <laughs> representing the Wall Street Journal, I think that everybody would know that was the turning point for TikTok. But I think uh, no. But yeah, we hired a team of, of people to do TikTok. For yeah. Us. So we'll see a lot of that, and I know that many of you, of course, are, are actively following that topic. One final topic about the industry, you know, a thing that, and I know that you're concerned about this, and rightfully so, is the safety, the the, the actual yeah. safety of journalists. You have one journalist, I believe, in, in Russia, in jail, Evan Gershevich, uh, I suppose, basically for doing his job. Correct. Um, and then, of course, many colleagues from other uh, um, news media have been killed in conflict, perhaps this year more than any year in recent history, including, of course, uh, several dozen in, uh, in Gaza and, and Israel. Uh, tell us a little bit about why that's so dear to your heart, beyond, of course, a very obvious uh, reason. Well, I mean, I think that one of the things I've seen in the course of my professional lifetime, unfortunately, is a dramatic uh, restrictions on journalists and skepticism of journalists and the role that they can play around the world uh, taking hold in many places, including many places that you'd think of or that have a heritage of being democratic or, or, or open. As you mentioned, uh, also, th there's been less distinction for the role that journalists can play which has made them uns unsafe. I mean, we know that, in, and you mentioned Gaza, I think more than 30 journalists is the latest count. Yeah, that's uh, incredible. Now look, I, I mean, obviously what's happening in Gaza on a human level is uh, there's, there's a great deal of tragedy and suffering and sorrow, and I don't mean to make the journalists' tragedy and sorrow and suffering uh, out, you know, larger than Stand the larger there. situation, but, but there's no, you know, being a journalist doesn't get you any protections or any difference or any role or any recognition in any particular way in that place. In Russia, you know, our, the reporter at the journal, Evan Gershkovich, this happened after I stepped down, about a month after I stepped down, but Evan was doing his job and they have an extremely restrictive media law now there. They've since arrested a second journalist. During the time I was editor, most of our journalists in China were expelled. Uh, and just kicked out one day? We, we so if, if we don't um, particularly are aware or care about the news industry as such, because we don't know it, for example, we don't understand the role that it plays, why should we still care about the safety of journalists and them being able to do their job? Why does it matter for all of us and, and, and the economy and the business that, world that we're in? Well, uh, for a couple reasons. One, uh, broadly speaking, and by the way, this is very true in business. This is one of the roles the journal has played. 
business around the world benefits from the free flow of information and insight and understanding of the world. So obviously, journalism extends well beyond business, but if you want to understand China, if you want to understand India, if you want to understand what's happening around the world, journalism at its best can play a really important and valuable role in helping you have a deeper understanding and enrich your knowledge of the world and, and, and bring it to life. There's also, frankly, and I realize that journalism is not always at its best. Like other industries, we, we have many problems and many self-inflicted wounds in journalism. But we play a really important role in accountability, in holding governments to account, and holding companies to account, and holding bad actors to account. Um, journalism is one of the few uh, you know, consistent, strong checks in some societies on such behavior. And uh, that's important for all of us, I think. Mm. If you believe in democracy or, or, or even enlightened government, the role that journalists can play uh, is vital. Yeah, and I think we, we, I would certainly agree with that. Adrian and I uh, uh, helped support, I think, back in the day at the World Economic Forum, this initiative called One Free Press mm -hmm. uh, at a time when sort of everyone understood uh, journalism is under pressure and needs that, that support. Uh, turning, uh, switching back here a little bit towards, you know, your own uh, career, uh, of course, Matt, we want to yes. talk about that. Um, you know, you said you studied, I, I believe, in Northwestern University in the, in did, the United yeah. States, uh, the Midwest, I suppose that is. Yeah. Northwest, uh, I suppose, officially. Well, th that was the Northwestern Territory <laughs> of the United States for a long time. Um, and so after that, you said you did not immediately start the Wall Street Journal because, you know, the smarter guy in your class got the job. Uh, what did you do instead and why? Ha. Huh. Well, I drifted. I drifted. I wasn't sure if I wanted to stay in journalism. I wasn't sure if journalism was the right profession for me. Uh, and I was pretty young, so I started um, actually, first I worked as a copy editor in the sports department in a newspaper in Virginia. And then I went back to a year of graduate school, and I spent a lot of the year of graduate school not doing my assignments, but reading books. And I realized, I mean, I was conflicted about journalism, you know? I mean, I was, this is the 1980s, and people, a lot of people really dislike journalism now, and let's face it, there's some bad journalism out there. And I had to reach the decision that I thought I could do quality work of integrity and make some difference and enjoy that if I could find my way to those places where I could do that. And every field, every profession has its great actors and its bad actors. So journalism was no, nothing different that way. Um, and then I uh, went to work as a reporter. I worked as a police reporter at a very local news agency in Chicago in the, the early 90s doing very gritty work covering fires talking to cops, uh, just showing up at, at places like that. You would uh, ever see a cat in a tree? Uh, is that... Uh... Uh, no, no, <laughs> uh, no. But there What's was... your most trivial story that you reported on? Most trivial? Oh, there were a lot of them. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, but, but it, was, it was, joking aside, it was a good experience. You know, I mean, I was a fairly sheltered suburban kid, so... You know, one day, uh, the kind of thing that you would do, this is local news, Chicago, one day a, a guy was driving his car, and by the way, this is before the internet and finding information out has become much Many easier. decades, I suppose, before the Many internet. Many decades, thank <laughs> you, yes. And, uh, but one day, uh, a guy was driving in a suburban neighborhood in Chicago and he was taking prescription drugs or something at his own time and he passed out while driving and he drove across a ball field and he ran over four kids who were killed. Right, and terrible. It was a big local story. So I come into work and my editor says, you have to go out to that suburb, find his house, find him, knock on the door, see if he'll give us an interview. So to have to figure out from neighbors where that guy lived and figure out which house was his and then walk up and knock on the door and see if he'd talk to me, that was pretty wow. you know, challenging wow. to do for a slightly introverted young kid, but it was a good experience. Yeah, and so obviously it set you up also for success later down the road. Many people tell uh, us that when they look back on their career that sometimes going a little slower in the beginning uh, to sort of learn the ropes will help you set up to be more successful later on. Is that also your experience? When did you actually sort of feel like you broke through, that you made it, if you will? I was incredibly frustrated and restless at different times in my 20s that I wasn't making much money. Doesn't explain why I picked journalism. That I was living in a couple of smaller towns in Virginia and I wanted to be in New York. And I had all these romantic illusions about what it would be like to be in New York. And I was frustrated <laughs> that my life wasn't moving faster. Um, and when I look back on that, I'd say, uh, one, I had a lot more time than I realized, and two, um, I should have enjoyed it more because I had freedom and the ability to really be learning and trying and doing fun stuff that, pay, that 
paid great dividends down the road, but I was too anxious sometimes to enjoy that. So, What, what, what does that mean in practice when you say, I should have enjoyed the, the journey more? Yeah. Um, what, you, know, you should have gone out more, you should have traveled more. I should more. have just enjoyed being in the moment more. I was too worried about what's next and too anxious about getting a job and what am I going to prove and where am I next and what's happening next. I just... I. And I was very lucky to be young and doing stuff like that. Journalists are very privileged. You know, you get to right. do and see all kinds of fun things and interesting things and meet people and be in places. It's being more about being in the moment, maybe yes. the same experiences, yes. but lived them more profoundly. Yes. Um, and of course, the, one of the reasons why you might say that is because, you know, at the end of the day, there is such something as, you know, a destination. You'll get there eventually. Do you believe in that? That's sort of like, you know, it, it, that there is some sort of a fate that, you know, eventually if you're meant to succeed, you will succeed, and therefore it's important to enjoy the journey more? I don't know if I believe in there's a fate of getting there somewhere, but I think what I, I think it depends on who you are and what success looks like to you. Um, I think I, I became ambitious at some, I didn't set out to be the editor-in-chief of the Wall Street Journal. At some point I became more ambitious about it. Um, I think I was too, frankly, in my case, I think I was too anxious and insecure about a, a certain status. The happiest people I know in journalism, and, the, and in some ways the most successful people I know, are the diehard reporters who know how to talk to people who relish engaging with other human beings and have no desire to become editors or move up right. the food chain or, or, you know, a lot of people become editors and move up the food chain to make money or to, be, to get, you know, the benefits and stuff. Um, there, there's a certain kind of person you meet in a newsroom, and I, I couldn't do it. God, I, I don't know how they do it. They are on the phone all day. They are talking to people all day. There's a guy, there was a guy at the Wall Street Journal who became probably as expert as anybody in the United States about plane safety and plane crashes because he'd covered the FAA for so long. Right. He, he knew more than most administrators coming in, and he outlived those people, and he loved it. So success depends on finding your thing that's going to make you happy. That's, yeah. and, and it just depends on, on who you, on what and, that is. And you, I think you also told me at, at some point that you know, when that time came that you sort of learned to let go, that that's also when things started happening for you. Too. Yeah, I mean, it, it took me to middle age, but when I started to say I'm going to enjoy the job I'm in and the moment I'm in and try to make the most of it and not worry about what's next, that was important in making yeah. me happier and probably actually leading to some success. And obviously, you have been uh, editor-in-chief of the Wall Street Journal. Before that, you were the deputy editor-in-chief of the Wall Street Journal, which is when, when I met you and when Adrian met you, you as well. Um, and so you've had uh, this sort of... And then when I became editor, I didn't have to spend time with <laughs> yeah, you. That's right. I could get the you know, this is one of the unfortunate things that, you know, even now yeah. you're no longer the editor, you still have to interact yeah. with me. Um, but, but, you know, of course, you, that means that you have had sort of that bird's eye perspective. You have interacted with a lot of other people who made it to the top, business leaders, people that we would all recognize. You mentioned Donald Trump, but I know there's many more, you know, billionaires. I think he didn't you... make it to the top as a business leader. Obviously. Right, right, that's right, that's right. Uh, that's, a, that's a factual <laughs> correction from a journalist. He was born into it. <laughs> uh, but somebody like Elon Musk you would have met, uh, or other tech entrepreneurs. Um, and so you, you've had a, a big perspective on all of these people. And one thing that I find very interesting is that you said, having seen it all, having seen all the business leaders, all the entrepreneurs, one of my conclusions is it's very lonely at the top for many people. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, first, some of these people just have an inner drive that uh, most of us don't. And in some ways, probably most of us are happy not to have that inner drive. I mean, they often have an obsession or something that just really compels them there. Uh, sometimes it's an idea. Sometimes it's an inner insecurity or, or, or just something else. It's not something that's, despite all the business books and all the advice columns and things like that, it's not necessarily something that's easily replicable. It's something that is often very unique to the individuals. Second, um, I, I just have found very often, not always, but very often for, for some of them, because they've got such a drive, it's never satisfied. Right. They're always impelled to move on and move Always forward. someone that's still more powerful it's not necessarily about competing with other people. It could just be they're not happy. They're perfectionists. They have to do right. something. And they so get to the moon, then they want to get to Mars. We, 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 I've just thought about this over time. I mean, we, it, particularly in America, I think, where business and entrepreneurialism is, is just so big a part of our culture, we admire that. And there are admirable things about it. I don't mean to make it seem not admirable. But 
you often find that no matter what success they've achieved or where they're at, they, there's still something egging them on, there's still something bothering them, they, they, they have a hard time taking satisfaction in their lives. And the loneliness just comes from, you, you end up in a world in which nobody can relate to the kinds of things that you're doing and thinking your about. Your peers are no longer there, you said. You're, you're, you're working hard all the time, you, your peers are gone, and in fact, you know, everybody works for you on some level for some of these guys, and that also means periodically you are firing your friends or shaking things up or making hard decisions to run the company. And I, I so I think, you know, I think it's, at, they're, they're laudable and admirable achievements uh, and, and things that many people have made. I, I don't, but it's, it can be tough for them. It can be, yeah. it can be challenging. And, and something that you've observed also in places like Davos where we've both been is you say, you know, on the outside, it looks like these people are highly successful and, and thriving. Uh, on the inside, once you get to know them, in fact, often they're not even functional human beings. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, is that, you know, what, tell us a little bit more about that. Well, their whole life becomes work, and you have people to do it all for you. It might sound great, but you know, many many people use work also to escape personal problems, to escape personal relationships, to you know, families and r romantic relationships and children is messy. There's no rules. Work is great because work has rules. Work has rules and structure and wins and losses. So there are people who thrive in the workplace and can't maintain a relationship you know, or their kids don't talk to them. And it's, it can be rather, rather poignant, I think. Um, I think, <laughs> I, I don't want to bore everybody, but there was, a, the, so one of the most famous CEOs of my time, I just don't know if his name uh, registers much, was uh, the, the head of GE, Jack Welsh. And I was sure. a GE reporter. I mean, he's kind of a legendary figure. And the uh, businessman of the 20th century. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Anyway, he that's, went, that's what Fortune said that he, where I now work, he, not you. So he went through a famous uh, fight after he stepped down in 2001, and he had a famous contract fight with the company because it was revealed after a couple of years that he had a contract in his retirement where the company he had corporate apartments, he had people to do his dry cleaning, he had florists, all these things were done for him, and shareholders got outraged that the company was doing all these things for him. And I talked to him, and I sort of realized, well, you know, he he wouldn't have been able to function as a former chairman without somebody. The guy, hadn't, the guy hadn't written a check in about 40 years. He didn't know how to buy things. Here he in Europe, he, uh, people haven't written a check in 40 he, years he anyway. Yeah, uh, fair enough. But he, he, hadn't, he hadn't used a debit card. He hadn't gone to the grocery store. He couldn't, he, he just, there were things he just didn't do and couldn't do that were like normal human things because he'd been giving his whole life to work. Right. And you're living in this very rarefied atmosphere. And it sounds exciting, but I think it's also... In many ways, Sad stifling, way. stifling. Yeah. yeah. Um, one other icon, you could say, of the modern business world that you've met and even spent 24 hours with, I think, is Elon Musk. Uh, could you 24 tell us, hours? Well, or, you know, you spend a day with him, I believe. Can you tell us a little bit of how that was and how it is? You know, uh, could you tell us how it, how it was, how it is, how it should be? Um, uh, it's a reference to a, a 90s song. Uh, uh, yeah, I did, I did know him a little bit. I, I'm cautious to say too much. I don't want to, you know, one of the things that happens if you're Elon Musk or, or any of these guys is somebody like me shows up and spends a little bit of time with you, and then we go out there and we act like we're the experts who <laughs> know everything about you. So, you know, I'm modest about that with him. I interviewed him. I spent a little time with him. You know, I, I guess the thing I, the two things that just struck me with him in the time I had with him is that he, he and I, I, could, I could be critical of him, but the things that struck me just from my personal interactions with him were he, he, he's very smart in certain technical ways particularly and thinks hard about things. And I think fundamentally, and this isn't always true, some people are in jobs like that to make money. I think fundamentally at root, he wants to do things. He right. wants to make a new car. He wants to make rocket ships. He wants to go to Mars. In other words, he's, he's not the girl who's impelled by doing real things, which I think is, you know... Just, Laudable. You, yeah, you, you cut through all the other stuff and all the things that have assembled around him. I do think that that's pretty central to who he is. He also, um, and you'll have heard this before or seen him, He's oddly engaging one-on-one, -on -one, and I say oddly because it's not necessarily what you expect if you're reading his social media account or you're reading the stuff around him or you know about his life or you know, you know about his personal relationships. 
but he, he really focuses on you, he tries to listen to your question, and he's willing to go odd places, and he's very engaging. Look, I've, he's, he has called me a couple times when I was editor directly, even when he was angry about coverage or a story or disagreed with us, but he could have a very direct, civil, clear discussion, and he would even chuckle during it. And I thought, he, he just, he, he, he says himself that he's on the autism spectrum, I guess. Right. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't classify that, but, but he's engaging, he can be engaging one-on-one -on -one in a way that's not always very common. Mm. And that's interesting to me. Maybe finally on that, is there anyone in business that you've been very much in awe of, very, that you're very much impressed by as a business leader? Uh, awe is probably too strong a word. Um, I, I, I try not to be in awe of people. Right. I try to I think that's one of the perks of being a journalist for so long time. I guess that's true, but I don't think any of us should be in awe of people. Mm. I mean, they're just people. I think we should all try to, 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 to... I mean, I think we should be sympathetic at a certain level and empathetic as human beings, but I think... I think there's a great deal of uh, smoke and mirrors around the mystiques for all these people. And, you know, I mean, you, you do get the chance to see them when they're tired and grumpy and behind the scenes. I, so, um, you know, so I'm, I'm a little cautious about that. I think as business leaders, um, I think, uh, well, look, I mean, I think Tim Cook is a pretty impressive guy in many CEO ways. CEO of Apple. Yeah, CEO of Apple. Uh, I had met Steve Jobs. Jobs a couple times, who was obviously a unique presence in his way. There's a couple of people in banking and finance who I thought were impressive and had long-lasting uh, careers like Jamie Dimon. All of them have their flaws and it's not, this is an endorsement of all of them. But I mean, uh, Satya Nadella is an impressive person when you sit down CEO and talk to him. Yeah, I interviewed, I interviewed Satya last, uh, in a situation like this at Davos and uh, it was on AI. It was right after the ChatGPT stuff came out. Microsoft's a big backer of ChatGPT. And he did a really, he's very smart, he did a really impressive job of not answering one of my questions, but just talking <laughs> about what he wanted to talk about. But you know, you look at the records that they've put together, I, I tend to think, um, I tend to think it's hard to have longevity, it's hard to have records right. of business success, and also do it in a way that you know, creates, in the aggregate, broadly speaking, value, uh, value, and 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 good cultures and things like that. Yeah, so. but it's it's great to hear the, uh, some of those examples. Finally, and then I, again, I want to turn to the audience for questions. Of course, as last time, um, but I do want to come back to one thing that you mentioned, which is that ultimately one of the things you also said is that when you succeed in business um, uh, and you get lonely at the top, one of the things you realize is that probably one of the most important pillars, including for you as a business person is your family. Mm. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? You mean, are you talking about for me personally? or? I, I mean, I guess you could generic? talk it from a personal perspective or, or, or more generally. I suppose it's true in both cases. Well, one thing that happens for a lot of guys in business, though, or, and women, too, is that, is that, yes, it can be lonely, but uh, the odds are that you've, over the years at your company, that you've laid off a bunch of people who've gone off to start consulting firms so that you, some of your old mates you can hire back as consultants <laughs> and they come back to work for you. Well, look, I, I mean, family and friends, I would say. I, I, I would say that, I mean, I guess it's really a personal lesson for me, and at some level, it's probably the most mundane lesson that you've heard, that I've learned in, I've learned over the course of my career that many of the things that you hear that are mundane, right, you, but also you, you, once, you, once you experience them, you realize how true they are. There's a reason they became cliches. As your career changes, as it evolves, as people grow apart, as life brings you to new places, you find yourself at different points, particularly if you've gone through different jobs and experiences, you know, you'll find yourself at a place where many of the people who were important in your, in your 20s have moved away. They've started families of their own or, or you're, you're separate. And so having the family and the long-term connections, the people who've been there and that you've enjoyed, enjoyed something together along the way and the history and the memory, that, that matters a lot. It sounds like it sounds corny. But yeah, but you know, it's, it's also I, I mean, I suppose in, in in one way novel because of course when you're in your twenties, you know, the per the people that you spend most of your time with are your peers, yeah. are your friends, and you don't yet realize perhaps that over the long run in anyone's life, those are most likely to actually fall away, and the ones that stay are actually. Yeah, or and hopefully you maintain them, but nonetheless, you 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 get involved in your life. You get yeah. you you've got two young kids. That's and right. So you know that when you have two when you have children, which is great, it's wonderful to have kids, but you have a certain number of years where it's like you're in a tunnel, right? That's right, I'm it's definitely like, in the tunnel. 
It's like I went about seven years. I'm actually doing this now. I'm watching some movies from 15 years ago that I hadn't seen when my daughter was little. I got about seven years of Pixar movies locked into my head forever, and I've seen them all about 35 times while sitting there with her. Uh, I'll ne probably never see a Pixar movie again now because of that, but I'm catching up on movies I never saw. I mean, you're just in a certain time in your life, and that... I've just seen The Lion King three times in the last two weeks, uh, so... Um, well, Matt, I mean... It's, Hopefully it's, the cartoon, not the live... The, the cartoon one, in fact. So, um, so this has been very interesting, but I do want to make sure we open up to questions from the audience. So if you have a question, make sure to raise your hand. We're going to start right yeah. there and there. Uh, uh, raise your hand. And if you want to share where you're from, it's always interesting to hear uh, Matt is here uh, And with you can us. come at me. Peter was pretty nice about various questions with journalism, but I know journalism gets... That's right, yeah. Things, if you so. want to make it tough uh, for Matt, there's nothing he can't handle, he said. Go on, yeah, stand up and, uh, and have your question, and we'll go we over here. here. Yeah. Uh, should I also mention where I'm from? Sorry. If you want to, if I, you feel well, like sharing uh, it. Wait, uh, where are you? I don't, oh, there you are, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm Sebastian, I'm from Peru, uh, and I have a small question. Uh, as a journalist, how do you handle a difficult situation? You mentioned, uh, for example, that you can put the companies or even governments in check as a journalist. How do you handle these situations? Uh, Do you have with, a list of difficult situations with a, with a, with a comp with a comp uh, with a controversy regarding a monster company, let's say, or a government. Uh, what what kind of controversy do you think? Like, what do you mean? Let's say there's been. Let's. I'm going to use a national example from Peru. Okay. Repsol, the company Repsol, Spanish is, uh, energy company, yeah. spilled uh, uh, a lot of liters of um, gasoline into the ocean in Peru. And there was a lot of controversy because they weren't doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. To well, it, they they damaged the environment, the ecosystem in 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 the ocean in Peru. So, how as a journalist, how do you handle the situation? Right. Well, well, I've always believed the best posture for what I do. Again, I to be clear, because we talked a bit about the um, uh, the the difference in the U.S. papers between opinion and news. So when I talk about journalism, I'm talking about myself as a fact-based news reporter, and that's not a comment on other kinds of journalism. So opinion journalism is a great thing and can be done well, but that's not what I do. So coming at it from a reporting perspective, first I'm a believer in reporting and the power of reporting and facts. So in a situation like you described, you want to have smart reporters gathering information being as thorough and factual and complete as they can be. You, you want, if you're dealing with a powerful company, having your facts straight uh, is really important because they're going to come at you potentially. Second, I believe in at talking to everybody for comment, whatever you're reporting, making sure the company and the government and whoever else it is has a chance to comment to get their point of view across. Um, we practiced at the Wall Street Journal what we called no surprises journalism, which essentially very challenging for a reporter meant that if we had a big story on your company, we did it with Theranos. We went to Theranos repeatedly and asked them questions. Uh, and uh, they lied in many cases to the Wall Street Journal, but you know we reflected their comments. But you want to be fair, um, and you you have to have integrity in your processes in the news organizations. You have to have good editing, good systems, good structures, so that you can feel you're being you're pursuing the truth without an agenda as fairly as possible. And frankly, as a practical matter, then if the government or the companies are going to come at you, they know, they've seen it, that your process is transparent. Humility is important for journalists. Journalists can sometimes be too arrogant, but there's always more to learn. There's always more to talk to. There's always things that you don't know. And transparency about your processes and with your readers. That includes when you make mistakes, and you do, owning up to them, announcing them, apologizing for them. You know, so it, it, on a basic level, you have to just have integrity throughout your process and, and pursue the truth without, you know, uh, uh, without fear. Mm, that's excellent. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, we'll go over here, Thank and you. just a reminder to everybody else, you know, I know we're in a football stadium, so, you know, we're deep into the second half, so that's when the crowd gets most rowdy, um, but uh, if you do want to uh, allow for the questions to be asked and listen to their answers, mm -hmm. and if not, feel free to use your phone, um, but make sure that we can, we can hear you and let us speak. Okay, so my name is Benedetta, I'm from Italy. And my question is, um, so today corruption is one of the biggest challenges uh, forcing our world today. 
and journalism plays a vital role in exposing and combating corruption. And what are, in your opinion, those mechanisms uh, by which corruption contribute to conflicts and war? And given this, how can we prevent corruption also in journalism in order to reduce the risks of those conflicts, especially in countries where uh, censorship is prevalent? Did you, sorry, you said, what, is the, what are the ways corruption is happening at work and also how is it happening in journalism? Is that, mm -hmm. is that? Yeah. Oh boy, well, um, uh, if I get the question right, I hope I do. Um, you know, uh, well, there's all kinds of corruption. There's personal corruption, there's institutional corruption, wh whether it's government contracts, government favoritism, whether it's, uh, it's uh, companies getting extra muscle, a uh, finger on the scale from the governments. Sometimes there's outright corruption, right? Pay payoffs and bribery. Um, the, one of the famous stories that happened at the Journal when I was, um, uh, I think I was the US editor at the time, but was uh, when uh, there's also kind of like a, a sort of, uh, I don't know what the term is. There, there's a sort of using your muscle or your clout. One of the famous stories was uh, Chris Christie, the Republican politician when he was governor of New Jersey, uh, you know, f uh, f filling up the roads and, and causing all kinds of traffic problems to settle <laughs> scores with his enemies and, and companies and, and ordering them to fill the streets, which turned out to be... Look, um, I think covering corruption and trying to understand it in all its forms is one of the most important kinds of roles on ongoing for a journalist in all ways. So all reporters in all areas should be thought to, should be looking out for different ways it happens. It's important to document it and show it and have the goods. That's the challenge in reporting about it. Uh, making accusations isn't enough. You want to actually get the information, get the detail. Um, within journalism, I think, I hope, good journalistic institutions of quality and integrity are holding themselves apart and separate from uh, uh, organizations and governments aren't beholden to anybody and have pure independence. And hardest thing for a reporter, if a reporter sees true corruption at his or her organization, will be willing to report it out as well. And that can be a challenge. But, you know, different kind, I mean, uh, there's things I'm sure about the nature of uh, the society in Italy that are, uh, that I don't have deep enough information uh, to, to, to get into, but obviously it continues to be a challenge around the world. Thank you. And I think there was a question over there. Uh, if we can get a microphone, and then maybe also the lady over there, and then we'll come back to this side. Uh, hello, my name is Alessandra. I'm also from Italy. Um, so I wanted to ask, as someone who uh, belongs to a generation that has always uh, consumed uh, traditional journalism, so... Uh, mm -hmm type of journalism that would go more in depth. Um, as you were saying earlier today, uh, a lot of our journalism and information comes from video or mm -hmm. uh, shorter, short content uh, versions. So how do you think that uh, this kind of new way of uh, telling stories and giving out information will, give, uh, will impact our generation, which tends to consume this type of, uh, of knowledge? on the general understanding of what our world looks like today and what our society looks like today? Thank you. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, look, I don't romanticize the past or the kind of journalism that necessarily I, I consumed growing up. Uh, one thing about the, the world that I was born into um, was that there was a kind of a high barrier to entry for journalism. You needed a printing press or a television studio or lots of expenses. And so journalists played the role of gatekeepers. And many people look back on that with total nostalgia because they weren't awash in information. And there were positives to it, but there were real negatives to it. As people point out, for instance, there were many marginalized voices and different kinds of voices that were not very well reflected mm -hmm. in the media of that era. Um, and, and there was a, often a sort of a habit of taking an institutional narrative that kind of became the conventional wisdom that didn't allow for alternative views or different ways of viewing the world. So today, so I don't romanticize that. Today we have almost the inverse. I think the challenge for any of you as news consumers today or thoughtful consumers of information today is kind of twofold. One, you're so awash in information that 
determining what's real and what's not real and what's valid and what's invalid and curating is really a difficult task. It's really, really a challenge for everybody. Um, especially when you throw in that it, we all have some familiarity, I think, with the addictive quality or the, or the, the buttons to press on, on certain kinds of social media, certain kinds of posts. I mean, even in, in legacy journalism, we've become too addicted to sort of the hyped up headline and the buzzwords that will get clicks instead of necessarily always reflecting a, a truer version of the story. So I think that's a challenge for everybody, not just for your generation, but everybody in the world today. You see it in the war, you know? I mean, there's so much flooding ourselves from the war every day and there's real information in that, and there's active propagandists on all sides of the conflict that determining what's real and what's not is a challenge. And that's the second challenge, which is there and is coming our way more so, which is the technological one. Uh, AI and deep fakes and will make it even easier to manipulate information, make it harder to tell what's true from what's not true. And Technology also, ch frankly, changes the way that we think. It, it affects our attention span. Some issues do demand an attention span and going deep in a nuanced view. I mean, heck, I'm, as, I'm sure I'm as distractible by my phone as anybody in this room is. Mm. And the way technology changes how our brains work and changes how we think about things is a, it's just a challenge for us as human beings and citizens as well. So I think that th th they're different challenges, but they're real. Thank you. And then there was another question, I think, over there. Uh, and I will return to this side of the room if there's anyone there. And over there, there in the next. dark. There's, yeah. one, there's one over there, too. That's great. Go on. Hi, uh, I'm Harleen Valia. I'm from India, and I'm a journalist by profession. Oh, wow. So, Sorry okay. about that. <laughs> <laughs> so my question to you is, in the era of information overload and fake news, how can we prioritize and maintain editorial integrity while delivering news to, to a diverse audience? How can you, sorry, prioritize, maintain? You're talking about from a journalistic perspective institute? or, sorry. or? Uh, I've done my graduation in journalism and yeah. mass communication, and then yeah. I was working for uh, Times of India, India Today. Okay. Yeah. So you're thinking like, how can the Times of India help prioritize and serve no, in general? Or? Maybe the Wall Street Journal. Oh. How, how do you prioritize? Well, one of the ways I thought about it at the, look, we are awash in information. It's really funny, but the Wall Street Journal, to give you an idea, so the Wall Street Journal, when I joined, was truly the business newspaper of record. And to give you one example uh, from the pre-internet age, right, we all, we see companies report their earnings every quarter. The Wall Street Journal would run print page after print page of earnings tables because it essentially was the only way you could get those. You know, because there was no internet, digital, you, unless you wanted to go to Washington, D.C. and get the filings. And by the way, the journal also had a fantastic lucrative advertising business because companies had to make public notices every time they were raising money or doing shares and taking an ad out on the Wall Street Journal was considered a way to do that. So that was the model then. Today, I would think of it this way. We're, as you say, we're all swimming in information. The service a, 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 a publication like the journal has and what its readers might come to us for is how can we pull out of this ocean of information the, the best ladle full of whatever nutritional and helpful information that you need to do your job, to, to go about your day? How can we ourselves take on the role of creating? And, and I would just think in general of then trying to think what's our core mission? What are our readers coming to us for? What do they expect from us? What that, where are we bringing value add that's different than other things? And if you were only going to read the journal today, even as information, how can we be of most value and service to you? And that's how I would try to think about it. I think that's a really important role for the mainstream press as we've evolved if people want us to do that role. Um, but look, I would also say any good news consumer, I'm loyal to the Wall Street Journal, every, any good news consumer should read several sources of news, mm. and balance them against each other. Uh, That's I, very interesting so, as well. Yeah. Um, I know there were two questions over there, so we'll take both of them at the same time, and then to end, we'll come uh, over here. We'll see if we have time. I know you, you actually uh, have wanted, wanted to ask a question even previously, uh -huh. so we'll, we'll try to get to you still. Um, hi. So I come from Georgia, Tbilisi. I'm not a journalist, but I'm a writer, and I have written a lot of articles for a lot of online publications, not as big as, as Wall Street, though. So my question here is more specific. So you have been an editor-in-chief for Wall Street Journal, 
journal for 20, 29 years. Oh, no, I was only editor-in-chief for almost five, I, but I did work <coughs> journal for 29 years. But you worked there. Yeah. So you have been there to see the rise of Asian tigers. And you have mentioned that journalism in Asia particularly has been very hard for journalists because of the cens censorship there. And my question regarding that is that, is our view of Asian tigers and the Asian economy in general accurate? And what, what is your opinion regarding this topic? And what do you think uh, was the role of Asian tigers and other Asian conglomerates in today's economic world? Thank you. And then we're going to pass the microphone to the person sitting behind you that also had a question, and then you can answer both uh, at the same time. I think the rise of Asia during the court was one of the most profound things that happened during the course of my career. Uh, I'm old enough to remember uh, before all that began, and to watch so many different countries in different ways in Asia become such gigantic economic actors and forces and become so influential in the, in the world it was one of the most profound things I saw. By the way, lifting millions and millions and millions of people out of poverty and creating new opportunities and new kind of, you know, lifestyles in many good ways and some bad ways. It's obviously been profound. It's going to continue. I mean, Asia's where, Asia is increasingly the center of uh, Global economic economy. activity in the world, and I think that's going to continue given, uh, given the power of Asia and the demography there. I mean, India's moment... Uh, it's, uh, India is still really rising and, and, and breaking through more. Uh, India is, uh, I've been to India a few times, and, and in the, the, in, maybe India is just coming into its big moment now still, but I think mm -hmm. that's where a lot of the energy in the world is. Any concerns about the journalistic freedom in those countries? I mean, obviously in China, it, there, there isn't much journalistic freedom. Um, the situation in India can be complex because there, there's more freedom, but there's intimidation of journalists and challenges there. And I'm not deeply versed in all the nuances the of theater, it, so I can't uh, yeah. say I'm expert enough. But I would say, look, around the world, the United States is you, is just about unique by having its First Amendment, right? Which is sort of which guarantees, which in guarantees, absolute terms, yeah, and, the freedom and, of speech. And 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 look, I mean, frankly, I, I'm concerned about speech codes in Europe, which mm. I think are too restrictive in some cases. So, um, you know, I... It, Thank you. No, no, I, uh, we understand. Um, go ahead. Hi, my name is Wase Kelin, and I study business administration. Uh, my question is, as a former chief editor, uh, what was your great, greatest achievement and you still hold dear today and why? My greatest achievement? In your line of work? Uh, thank as you. A former. Well, uh, uh, probably actually surviving in the job, <laughs> given the stresses <laughs> of journalism, was enough of an achievement in and of itself. I mean, look, I think, um, uh, I don't know, I think, look, uh, the hope when you become, when you get a job, when you're fortunate enough to get a job like that, and you realize the pressures in the world and the challenges that you face, you, you, you hope you leave the place in better shape than you found it. So I felt I was you know, proud of, despite setbacks and challenges that we faced, proud of a couple things. We, we, we had some really memorable, important stories that were significant. We created, broadly speaking, a newsroom where a lot of our journalists could do great work and thrive. Um, we, uh, we grew the audience digitally and made the digital transition faster and more accelerated, so more people were subscribing and reading the journal by the time I was done than when I started, and it's in substantial numbers. And, you know, we all, anybody leading an institution had to navigate through the pandemic and through the last few years of the challenges of the Trump administration and other stuff, and I feel we did pretty good on that front. Not perfect, not perfect, but I'm just proud to have done my bit on mm. those things. Thank you. Um, I, I know that we're in extra you time promise. now, so I want to, the, the two last questions in extra time will go here and there, and if we have time, uh, let's see if we can get to that, that, that question over there. Can we bring the microphones here? And let's, let's see if we can have the two questions asked first before you answer, uh, and then see if we can you go there. Both questions, okay? Yeah. And then we can okay. choose whichever one we like more. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Leslie um, from Nigeria. My questions is um, based on bias reporting. 
Um, I'm sorry, can, can you just... Bias reporting. Bias. Yeah, it's, it's the noise in the background. I, I can't hear that well. Sorry. Okay, yeah. I've got two questions. Now, my first question is, um, um, how does your editorial team ensure a balanced representation of different perspectives in news coverage? And second one is, um, um, what editorial guidelines are in place to prevent unintentional um, bias in, in news articles? Thank you. So about balance and bias, and then a question here. If you want to pass on a microphone. Yeah, and if not, Matt will stay here for a little while after um, as well. We can't hear you that well. Yeah, thank you for your time. time. Thank you for your coming. My name is Nard. So talking about the broader frame of journalism in the US. So since you worked in that field for about 29 years, you mentioned that journalism and mainstream media has a huge role in accountability and in keeping huge populations well informed. So in your case, in the US, keeping about 330 million people well informed about what's actually happening in the world. Mm -hmm. So my question is, keeping in mind uh, the USA's influence on the rest of the world, how well do you think that the US is doing in terms of journalism, in terms of being fair and reporting unbiased factual information without leading people into certain biases or political agendas? Thank you, and I, I do think we can actually can take we just, those We two. just have a couple of very small questions about News Corp <laughs> bias of the state of the United States as we're running. Yeah, through. no, I think that's great. Uh, we're ready for it. Okay, just remind, walk me through the question, rephrase the question. So, you know, how can we make sure that news reporting is balanced and, and is free of bias, uh, and basically what's the state of, of U.S. journalism vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, informing its own citizens and the rest of the world? Is that fair? You agree with both? I mean, <laughs> so, uh, when you're... It obviously depends on the organization. I'll be honest with you, it's a, it's a hot topic of, con of, of discussion today in newsrooms. It's a hot topic of discussion for many young journalists who, who think you can't be objective, you can't be fair. And you'll probably never be perfectly objective or fair. But how do you try to think about bias? It requires self-awareness on the part of the journalist about where she or he comes from and what influences are in their lives. It, 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 requires a journalistic ethos of reaching out to people and talking to people. I've always thought journalism on some level is fundamentally an empathetic activity, so it has to be, you have to be open-minded and cultivate a, a place where you talk to more people. You have to be transparent about mistakes and issues if you run into them. Um, and you have to keep people looking always for um, the next fact, the next thing, the next thing to learn. And never assume you know more than you do. So it's really, a lot of it is about cultural cultivation and what you're presenting and the kinds of things. Then hopefully within you've got a process with editors and, and along the way who are challenging and questioning the work and working together to make it better. I've thought if I compare journalism to social media, and I have no problem with social media or citizen journalists, but if you look at X or Twitter, it's often about your first blurt, your first reaction. Journalism should be a higher level activity. You should be reporting, learning something, and then I can challenge you, and together, two or three people can make that a better early mm. take, what's hopefully more sophisticated and nuanced. So hopefully you've got a culture that does that. Across the US, a very complicated question. It's hard to answer in 45 seconds. Journalism is on the ropes. Uh, journalism is challenged in the US for all kinds of reasons, business reasons. As I mentioned, we've lost more than half our jobs in the United States in certainly legacy print in the 20th century. Um, uh, sorry, 21st century. Um, a lot of people are disengaged from the news, don't read the news closely. I'm not going to tell them that they should take their medicine, but there's a lot of people who just don't turn to it. That The habit of serious news reading is not as deeply uh, uh, cultivated in the U.S. as it is, I think, in Germany. Something like half of people in Germany read uh, serious news publications. Um, and you face the pressures of the internet that everybody else faces. Some of the biggest challenges we have in our business are self-inflicted. You know, to, to make your business model work, you have to sometimes chase clicks, and you have less time to report deeply, and you have more output expectations, and all these other kinds of business challenges. So, I think there's still, happily, a great deal of good and strong work coming out in the United States. And some institutions, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, uh, magazines, the Atlantic, the New Yorker, that do much great work. Many of the networks do much great work. Some of it is, is mixed, of course. 
Um, but there's a lot of great work coming out, but the stresses in getting it out there and getting people to see it are very high mm. and challenging us. Matt, I want to, I know we reached, you know, the, the very last seconds in football terms of our, of our session. I want to give the last question to the lady over there, uh, and then I want to go and proceed and, and thank you and, and, and Erdem as well. Go on. And my last no. <laughs> goes a little in hand with the last question. In the future generations, how, especially in the U.S., how do you think the Wall Street Journal is going to change in regards with this new woke culture and the woke generations? And are you assuming that the, the woke? Uh, are you assuming that the woke like culture the crystal, lasts and becomes bigger, or doesn't last? Like the crystal generation or the woke culture that exists, especially in the U.S., which we could say is like the crib of it. How do you think that is going to change journalism in the future as new generations take Yeah, sort of uh, yeah. gain significance. I don't know if I think wokeness has much to do with it one way or the other or particular uh, ideological or, or philosophical views people take. My, my view is whatever they think personally, people will always need some sources of factual, fact-based information. I hope the Wall Street Journal will long continue to be one of the places that provides that, separate from philosophical views or opinions. I think the job of journalism, broadly speaking, is whatever you think of it, I give you the facts and you can act on them as you wish. It's not the job of the media to act. It's your job as a citizen. I, I, I think as long as the Wall Street Journal or any news organization continues to focus on giving you the facts and also thinks about what it's covering as the world changes. For instance, the Wall Street Journal covered, you know, we didn't used to cover EVs or, you know, different kinds of alternative energy, but we've covered them as those have become bigger industries. If the journal can adjust to that, if journalism can adjust to those things, I think they have a good future. I hope people mm. will want them. But that's the job of journalists. Okay, thank everybody's you, Matt. restless. And uh, that's right. We're going to go uh, on the final break now. I want to thank everybody. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was great. That flew by. Okay. okay. And for those of you, I know you're still in Business Immersion Week. Erdem will be coming back later this week with a master class. And if you have any further questions for Matt, you can now uh, approach him uh, separately. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.